In Dungeons & Dragons, the ideal of a pure-hearted paladin meeting out justice in the name of good is all too common. But something not always explored is where the line between justice and tyranny actually stands, and what happens if the one drawing that line is a powerful dragon with an agenda. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that doesn't believe in utensils. Today we are continuing the ongoing mission to explore the history and lore of every dragon left behind by 5th edition D&D by talking about yet another member of the Ferris Dragon family tree the Tungsten Dragon. If you're a new viewer or simply haven't watched my video about Iron Dragons, I highly recommend you watch that one first before watching this one because I went over a lot of stuff about what a Ferris Dragon is and all the side information related to them, and I'm not going to be repeating all of that in this video. But if you fancy yourself a rebel and don't care to do so, the primary thing you need to know is that Ferris Dragons are a classification of dragon similar to metallic or chromatic dragons. They just exist in a separate group and and they are all lawful. So today, we're gonna dig into the Tungsten Dragon. We'll be going over its publication history, lore, ecology, and of course converting it into 5th edition D&D so you can bring it to the game table and make all your players do the shock Pikachu face or whatever the kids are up to nowadays. I know a ton of folks have requested this one, and for good reason, but before we excavate this draconic creature, I want to give a massive shout out to this week's sponsor, Displayed. Now I know this might ruin some of the movie magic for you guys, but I actually filmed these videos in front of a green screen. But behind that green screen is this. Let's take a closer look, shall we? Displate is a truly unique, one-of-a-kind metal poster designed to help you show off the stuff you love in the form of awesome metal posters. When they reached out to sponsor a video, I was stoked because I'd always heard how awesome these posters were, but I never actually got a chance to check them out for myself. So do they live up to the hype? In my opinion, absolutely. Each displate is hand signed by their master of production, so first and foremost, quality control is out of this world. Secondly, if you're like me, and I know I am, you probably hate drilling holes in the wall or hammering in hooks to hang up your art, only to then realize that the frame is crooked or it's too heavy for the screw that you hammered in because you can't find the screwdriver, and the idea of cleaning out the basement to find the stuff you lost there a month ago makes you want to scream. But with displate, that's no problemo. They use a unique magnetic mounting system that takes only a few seconds to install. This was one of those things I would always hear people talking about and now that I've had a chance to experience it for myself, the idea of actually screwing something into my wall makes me feel like a caveman. Displate ships worldwide in four to five business days, and these bad boys provide an awesome alternative to standard posters that tend to get worn and torn over time, but also leave holes in the wall after the fact. So when you consider the fact that someday you'll be getting the full damage deposit back from your landlord, you can't afford not to get one. They're all made out of this super sturdy stainless steel that has an awesome look to it, and they've got literally over a million designs available. So if you can't find something you like, on their website, you probably just don't like anything. They have tons of independent art as well as official designs from brands like Elden Ring, Warhammer, and of course, Dungeons and Dragons. I had a really hard time choosing which ones I wanted them to send me because obviously they weren't going to send me the entire D&D catalog and there are a ton of awesome Dungeons and Dragons designs on their website. I'm particularly fond of the monster diagram posters that look like they're taken straight out of Volo's journal and all the retro D&D book cover art. Like. I've literally already ordered the rest of these to complete this collection. And the good news is, I can do that, and so can you by following the link in the description down below to get some sweet, sweet discounts courtesy of my new best friends. Also, one last thing to mention that is actually really important to me is that Displate is an entirely carbon neutral company. Essentially, that means they invest money in ecological preservation and other projects that help the planet to recover and counteract any negative side effects for the environment that their production might cause, which is very cool. Anyways, displates are dope, the hype is real, I want to put up more walls in my house just so that I've got more space to hang these things, and if you want to check them out for yourself, follow the link below and that will give you a nice little discount on your order, or you can also just go to their website and use code DUNGEONDAT at checkout to save yourself some cash. Now, it's time to steal yourself! What do you mean I already made that joke before? Yeah, well it's a good joke, nobody will even notice. Because it's time for Monster of the Week. Ah! 
tungsten dragons have a pretty unique look to them. They've got an abundance of horns on their head and neck, and a unique greenish hue to their scales that starts out as almost a ruddy brown when they first hatch, but gradually becomes a brilliant metallic color, and then eventually fades into a dull flat tone. Like all ferris dragons, they originally come from Dragon Magazine issue 170, with a third edition update hitting in Dragon 356, both of which house all the ferris dragon lore we really have. As I covered in my Iron Dragon video, all ferris dragons adhere to a rigid social hierarchy, with iron dragons sitting at the top. Tungsten dragons are second from the bottom in this hierarchy, giving them authority over nickel dragons, but making them beholden to all others. If we want to compare the structure to the hierarchy of a royal court, tungsten dragons are sort of like noble knights, serving at the behest of lords and ladies above them, but still having command over commoners. There you go, bringing class into it again! That's what it's all about! If only people would- Please, feel please, good people! I am in haste! And this knight metaphor extends even beyond their position within the Draconic Pyramid scheme. Tungsten dragons are an embodiment of knightly principles, but not in the way you might think. They're lawful good in nature, which means they prioritize fighting the good fight while adhering to the laws of their people. And that last part is an important piece of the puzzle, because the primary law of tungsten dragons when it comes to fighting the forces of evil is win at any cost. There are other examples of lawful good dragons, but tungsten dragons break away from most of them because they are beyond fervent in the destruction of their enemies. If you were to consider your average gold dragon to have a disposition similar to that of a paladin under the Oath of Devotion, tungsten dragons are conquest paladins through and through. To them, nothing short of total victory is acceptable. It's not enough to simply beat back the forces of darkness, you must pursue them, slay them all, burn their cities, and salt their fields. This means that, to a tungsten dragon, very little is off the table in pursuit of that goal. In their mind, the forces of evil will use every method at their disposal to undermine the forces of good, so there's no reason those fighting for the cause of what's right should hold anything back. They're willing to use subterfuge, deception, forbidden magic, and anything else that they can get their claws on. However, the one line they will not cross is allowing innocents to die. Otherwise, What's the point of fighting for the cause of good in the first place? If they have to sacrifice themselves, or a bunch of warriors under their command on the altar of battle in order to pull out that W, you better believe they're going to do so. But they will not take the lives of innocents, either through action or inaction, in order to achieve those goals. Now, of course the trouble with this is who is defined as an innocent, in their view, truly might depend on the dragon in question. But their rigid adherence to the hierarchy and the rules set forth by it makes breaking this rule something they are typically not willing to do for any reason. And this zealous pursuit of destroying evildoers is something that resonates throughout their entire culture and society. Like all ferris dragons, they live in small clans that are typically comprised of two elders and their children. Once a tungsten dragon becomes old enough to fend for itself, it has the option to stay with the clan or venture out on its own. There's no real stigma either way, it all just kind of depends depends on whether that dragon feels that they're up to the task of departing and starting a clan all their own. Tungsten dragons are also extremely honest in a way that others often perceive as beyond rude, but to them, there's no point in mincing words. Parents who don't believe one of their children is up to the task of departing to start their own clan will absolutely tell them as such, and a lot of the times, they're correct. They do their best not to let emotions get involved, not to say that they're completely emotionless beings, but there's often not malice or ego involved in the way these creatures speak, they just calls it like they sees it, and they all understand that to be a gesture of well-meaning. In fact, they often view other creatures who speak using lots of flowery language or with an abundance of concern for the person they're talking to as rude, because they're wasting the other creature's time. And wasting someone's time is considered one of the rudest things you can possibly do to a tungsten dragon. Oh my my motherfucking time! And this is the primary reason why they abhor brass dragons. While they are technically on the same side of the cosmic fence, they see them as verbose nuisances who would rather while away a century chatting about pointless dreck than actually doing anything worthwhile. And I mean, when your sole purpose in life is being driven by the mission to eradicate anything that is slightly resembling the face of evil, it's easy to see why they might not get along. Some tungsten dragons actually feel this so strongly that they view brass dragons as more of a hindrance to the side of good because they misuse their draconic gifts and powers in such an extreme way, at least in their opinion. And we've talked a lot about how these dragons hate evildoers and always want to bring the fight to the bad guys, but we haven't really talked about how they might do that. So let's move along and talk about what kind of abilities these creatures actually have.
As with most dragons, the Tungsten Boys have a claw, bite, tail, and wing attack, as well as that pesky, frightful presence. But what sets them apart is not only their breath weapon, but they've also got a couple unique abilities. I mean, their breath weapon's no slouch either. In fact, I think it's actually pretty cool. Tungsten Dragons breathe a cone of molten sand that deals a combination of bludgeoning and fire damage. Dual damage types are always neat, and I also just love the flavor of this dragon unleashing a torrent of hot liquid sand that quickly cools into glass as it hardens on whatever surface it lands. I can't help but imagine the battlefield after the fact, which would likely be covered in charred skeletons all encased in glass, and that's just neat. But in keeping with the theme of sand-related abilities, these bad boys all have an extra action from the day they're born called Sand Cloud. This is a once-per-day ability that creates a mini sandstorm surrounding the dragon that acts sort of like a smoke screen. But not only that, it also forces a concentration check from anyone casting a spell in the area on account of the whipping sands. This starts out as a 15-foot radius cloud, but its area of effect grows larger as the dragon does. Secondly, the dragon gains an ability called Immolation when it enters its second age category. And this ability does exactly what you think it does. I mean, as long as you thought it made someone spontaneously burst into flames. It can only target one creature with this ability, however the target takes a ton of fire damage and potentially catches fire based on how their saving throw goes. Again, as the dragon becomes older, this ability also scales, allowing it to target multiple creatures and then eventually just affecting everything within a 60 foot radius of it at the Ancient Age category. And at that point, this acts almost like an alternative breath weapon with a different area of effect and a wholly concentrated damage type. These abilities are both very good, but only really situationally and that's exactly what they're intended for. I mean, the dragon always has its breath weapon and other physical attacks, but it can bust out either of these abilities as a surprise against an enemy not expecting it, and I think that falls perfectly in line with the dragon's outlook on warfare. But that brings us to our next topic. Where exactly do these dragons live, and what are they fighting to protect? Tungsten dragons live in arid regions like deserts or dry plains. You know, places where you'll probably find sand. I don't like sand. This is unfortunate for them because not only do they often clash with blue dragons who make their homes in the same biome, but it also means they are frequently neighbors with brass dragons who also prefer dry regions. And while they may find the brass dragons exceptionally annoying, they will actively attempt to kill any blue dragon they see on sight. But as far as where they actually live within these biomes, tungsten dragons prefer to make their homes in rocky cave structures found within the region. While they can burrow and will make an underground home if necessary, they will avoid doing so in favor of a natural carved out cave system when available. Because they tend to live in clans, they need a lot of space. So any region with a tungsten dragon presence is going to be somewhat obvious, especially because they aren't really the stealthy type. I mean, they can be if the situation absolutely calls for it, but it's not within their typical skill set. In terms of the dragon's hoard, there's actually nothing in the source material that tells us what this dragon might hoard, which huh? can be either really good or really bad depending on how you feel about making up your own lore. On the one hand, it kind of sucks that we don't know anything about what these dragons like to hoard because it would be cool to know that, but maybe they don't hoard anything and that's the whole point. Maybe they view the idea of keeping a hoard frivolous. But on the other hand, it gives you, the DM, some room to develop them so that they can suit your needs. Personally, I like the idea that they might hoard a collection of skulls taken from their enemies all encased in glass. Or maybe they keep relics and family heirlooms from the ancient Ferris Draconic Empire as a reminder of their heritage and what they're fighting for. Whatever you decide to do there, even if what you decide to do is have them hoard nothing, I think a dragon sword is a really cool way to flesh out the dragon's personality and kind of what their worldview is like a little bit, so I definitely encourage you to take that idea and run with it. Now in terms of game mechanics, of course we need to talk about the regional effects imposed by a tungsten dragon's presence. And as always, none of that existed in the old lore because the idea of regional effects and layer actions wasn't really added to the game until 5th edition. So while there's lots of stuff you could do, I'm going to tell you what I came up with. As far as regional effects go, in much the same way where I had the Iron Dragon cause natural iron deposits to become more plentiful, the Tungsten Dragon causes steel deposits to crop up in the region surrounding their lair. Now hold on, before all the metallurgists and forged weapon enthusiasts decide to kill me in the comments, I'm aware that tungsten steel is not a naturally occurring ore. But this is D&D. Not only do I think a naturally occurring tungsten steel metal deposit is really interesting and cool, think about the implications of that for a minute. The process of refining high quality steel with medieval grade technology is at best a pain in the ass. But if there was a place that steel of this quality simply occurred naturally, that would be even more valuable to some than gold. 
But of course, this is the dragon's territory, so what does the dragon do? Do they establish some kind of trade agreement with the dragon, or does the dragon simply consider them innocents and actively protect the steel miners since they're mining steel for the forces of good? Maybe the Tungsten Dragon's army is fully kitted out in some of the best quality steel weapons money can buy. Or perhaps it considers anyone trying to mine this steel an intruder in their domain and in effect turns the process of steel mining into a life or death proposition. Something to think about. Secondly, much like the Iron Dragon, I gave the Tungsten Dragon the ability to detect non-precious metals within a certain radius of their lair. All Ferris Dragons in the old lore have some version of this ability, so all of my conversions will likely have this same metal detection ability. So. That one's kind of a given, but the third and final regional effect I chose to impose is that this dragon's lair is constantly hammered with sandstorms. Tungsten dragons are pretty wary of unknown creatures entering their domain, so I felt like an effect that made that domain difficult to traverse just made sense. In terms of layer actions, I gave the dragon a couple offensive options like pinning creatures to the ground with steel spikes that erupt from the floor and literally converting a section of the floor into lava. However, there is one unique layer action I gave this creature which allows it to alter the chemical properties of metal within its layer. The dragon can make a metal object within the layer temporarily weigh 10 times more than it normally does. If the object is a weapon, it forces the user to roll with disadvantage, but it also makes the weapon deal an extra 2d6 bludgeoning damage. If the object is a suit of armor, it cuts the wearer's speed down by 10 feet, gives them disadvantage on dexterity saves, and also grants a plus 2 bonus to AC. Both of these are trade-offs that might be beneficial in some cases, but if you have a strength of over 20, you get to just straight up ignore the downside of these effects. I feel like that is a great way for the dragon to buff its allies, hinder its enemies, and create some epic moments where they think they're shutting down the fighter or something only for them to pop a giant strength potion and come back swinging with anime style big ass greatsword moves. And that brings us to our next segment. How the heck do we use one of these dragons at the game table? I'm glad you asked. The Tungsten Dragon is kind of designed from the ground up to be your hardliner good guy who fights for the side of good but might be a bit extreme in their methodology compared to their allies. If you want to run that idea, the story essentially writes itself right out of the box. The party might seek the help of a Tungsten Dragon or might even be recruits conscripted into the army commanded by a Tungsten Dragon. The story would likely be revolving around some kind of major war or battle and as things progress it might leave the players asking themselves if the dragon's methods, which undeniably get results, are worth the cost. If you want to take this idea to its extreme, the Tungsten Dragons might even have some misguided view of what victory should look like and attempt to install a tyrannical state that ultimately ends up becoming something just as ugly as the enemy they fought against in the first place. So basically, just do Helldivers, but as a fantasy D&D campaign. Have the party fight dangerous battle after dangerous battle, all in the name of managed democracy. Remember folks, the only good goblin is a dead goblin. Or. Maybe your party's a group of warriors fighting from outside this perspective, actively trying to take down the Tungsten Dragons and their misguided attempt at liberation in order to truly free the people under their yoke. It's treason, then. But also, despite their strong, narratively baked-in personality elements, there are lots of other directions you could take this creature as well. Maybe you do something related to the potential neighbors this dragon is likely to have. Desert biomes are particularly popular with other dragons. I already mentioned blue and brass dragons, but looking at the entire list of dragons both officially brought into 5th edition and those that we've covered in this series so far, there are others to consider. Brown dragons are notorious for living deep underneath the sands, and yellow dragons have also been known to take residence in the desert when there's no available coastal region for them to settle. That means there are three species of chromatic dragon potentially sharing the desert, and one species of metallic dragon who is detested by the tungsten family tree. So basically, most of their neighbors want them dead, and the feeling is mutual, and brass dragons are flanders. Hello, neighborino to the north. I sure like the cut of your gibberish. Colin Doodly 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 Doodly
I mean, an all-out war between dragons in the region, of course, is possible. Or you could play it out like Game of Thrones, but with dragons in a desert. Lots of scheming, politics, backstabbing, and a little bit of all-out war, just as a treat. I also kind of like the idea of a brass dragon being the villain of this campaign. Maybe a corrupted brass dragon who plays the role of the harmless, if not a bit annoying trickster, is secretly pulling the strings and manipulating the other dragons into a situation where all are destroyed, leaving the entire territory for them. And if their schemes are ever completely undone, they always have the, it's just a prank bro defense to fall back on. I'm joking! Stop! 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 I also just want to take a moment to address the fact that we've talked about alignment a lot in this video, and while alignment and the kind of overarching battle between good versus evil are two elements that are pretty much ubiquitous in most fantasy settings, it shouldn't be something that taints your entire view of a whole ass dragon species. I think it serves as a really good reference for the typical cultural attitudes the dragons might have, but within tungsten dragon society there may be some who take these ideals to the extreme, while there are others who might have a more kind interpretation of those values, or even others who break with convention altogether. But with that said, for some options that don't necessarily focus the dragon as like the primary center of the campaign, Perhaps you could use a tungsten dragon as the MacGuffin. Maybe your adventurers hail from a small kingdom which is at war. A war they are losing. Badly. It's only a matter of time before their enemies bash down the gates and raise their homes to the ground. But not all is lost. At least not yet. There are rumors of an old general who lives in the mountains beyond the nearby desert. Nobody has seen or heard from him in ages, but tales of his ingenious exploits still ring across history. It might not even be apparent at first that this legendary general is a dragon. I mean, there are plenty of long-lived races in D&D. Some people might say he's an elf, others say he comes from the dwarves, and still others say he's a human who simply found the secret to immortality. But whatever the case, it seems like this rumor about an ancient general is the last desperate hope for the kingdom him, and as such, a group of adventurers sets out to try and find him. The party then has to traverse the desert, surviving every challenge sent their way until eventually they find themselves at the doorstep of the old commander, only to then discover he's a dragon. From here, the dragon might test them in some way to ascertain their intentions, or if he just believes their cause is just, could just come and help them. And that could just be the end of the campaign. The Dragon General returns, helps them win the war, and all is well. But if you want to actually play out the entirety of the war and the battles to come, maybe the Dragon sends the party on all kind of tactically unconventional missions. And then eventually this will come to a head and you can explore one of the previous narratives we talked about as a sort of second act. Alternatively, perhaps the party is being tested by the Dragon to see if they are worthy of living within the Dragon's domain. Maybe they're all settlers, members of a new village that was founded, unknowingly, in the territory of a Tungsten Dragon. So now they have to convince the dragon they're not evil, and they might actually be useful in the fight against evil in order to be allowed to stay in their new home. And lastly, if you want to introduce this dragon to your campaign but you don't want them to be a primary focus or even a major element, you can always have a side quest where the players can go collect some tungsten steel. That means a journey into the dragon's lair, and if it doesn't want them there, it could be pretty dangerous. But even if they don't actually encounter the dragon itself, could make for a pretty fun side mission, and if they're successful, they might get some sweet gear out of the deal too. But whatever you choose to do with this monster, as always, the stats for every age category of this dragon are linked in a Google document in the description down below, and of course if you're one of my lovely patrons over on the Dungeon Dad Patreon page, you can find the Tungsten Dragon stat blocks presented in the high res PDF format with the fancy schmancy new artwork, all the little sidebars, some cool ass layout, and all that good stuff which mostly is just my way of saying thank you to you for the financial support you guys throw my way and help make this show possible. Which reminds me, it's time for Patron of the Week. This week's randomly selected patron is The Hermit King. Thank you so much for supporting me all the way from up in the mountain castle I assume you live in. It means the most. And thank you for watching. As always, if there's a monster you would like to see featured on this channel from another edition of D&D or another tabletop game altogether, let me know in the comments down below or follow the link in the description to the Dungeon Dad Discord and let me know in the Monster Suggestions channel. Either way, it will be added to the Monster Master list, not the Monster Master list, the Master Monster list, which contains all the suggestions from the community and who knows. You might just see it show up on a future episode of Monster of the Week. I apologize, there was no video upload last week. I made a community poll announcement thing, but 
Nobody ever sees those, so if you didn't see the community post or you didn't see over on the Discord, there was no video last week because last week's video, or what was supposed to be last week's video, got crazy long. It's super long. I don't want to put a specific number on it because there's still parts of it I'm cutting down, but wow, it's long. It's not a sponsored video, but because of some other videos I have that are sponsored, I had to push it and I couldn't just push it to this week or next week. And so it's coming, I think the second week of April. I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I think it's not obviously this episode that you just watched. It's not gonna be next week, but the one after that. So whatever week that turns out to be. Anyways, it's gonna be wild. I am very excited about this video. I can't wait to show it to you. And between now and then, I've got something else very silly and very special coming up. Those of you who have been with the channel for a while know what to expect come the 1st of April, so we'll see what happens. In any case, I will see you then. Till next time. This monster has been baking for quite some time, but the real question is whether it actually comes from the Nine Hells or the bakery down the street. Let's hope he doesn't flake out and decide not to show up. Next episode, Pie Fiend. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.